Uh, I'm here to talk to you today about um, wireless security. Um, my blog is wifikiwi.com and I'm also on Twitter as wifikiwi as well. So what I'm going to concentrate today in this uh, presentation is, is really on security as a process. Uh, it's not something that you can constatically define and say, hey, if I put these things in, I'm going to be good to go. It's really something that you've got to keep an eye on over time and look at different systems that you might actually need to put in place for wireless security and also be constantly keeping updated on what new threats are out there, who, what might, different ways people might be able to get into the, the network and uh, where those threats are coming from. And, and basically just concentrate on the fact that, that security is about more than just implementing technologies, it's about processes and people as much as anything. All right, so uh, I, I thought I'd start out with a bit of a question first. What in your uh, experience is, is where different threats are coming from? Have you been aware of any particular attacks? I mean, for me personally, I. I've been following along with the target hack that came in recently that isn't specifically wireless related. But um, is, does anybody want to venture out there any particularly wireless related uh, threats that they've seen recently? Best Buy. Best Buy, that's a good one. Yeah, we've got TJ Maxx as well. That was a wireless related hack that came in through their uh, wireless terminals. Anyone else? Oh, okay. All right, and um, I'm not sure if you've all kept up on that there, there are new threats coming into the WLAN networks. I'm sure, as you're aware of it, um, many years ago, WEP was the big thing that people were really worried about, how to secure WEP, what different technologies we can board in. We had WPA and WPA2 board in as part of that. So, um, but it's not just standing still, right? All, the people that are attacking networks and, and wireless networks in particular, they're looking at different threats that are coming into the network and actually finding different ways of, it, of attacking the networks when we um, set up defenses for it. Um, from, from my point of view, the networks largely themselves, the methodology that we have of setting up wireless networks has, has become something that's relatively secure. So the hackers are actually looking for different ways of actually getting into the networks. Um, and we're trying to protect a lot of different devices as well in bringing uh, the security into the network. And what is really at the core of what we're trying to protect is, is the data. And we really need to, to look at what different types of data we, we're protecting within the network. Um, Mobile devices, uh, really, this is, to me, uh, classifying both tablets, phones, and, and laptops as all really being one class of device. Whatever device you have connecting to the network, you're wanting to look at security as a, a uniform thing from a very much higher level and concentrate on the security that you can put on those individual devices by the capabilities of that devices. Uh, Android is a little bit more flexible about both being able to attack it and also being able to put different security things in place on those devices. iOS, much more locked down, but um, still vulnerable to attack if you do certain things like jailbreaking, for example. Uh, laptops, uh, the users could have much more control over their laptops. It could be their own personal laptop that they're bringing in. Um, much more open to attack. Um, but then there are much more systems developed in order to, to actually deal with the attacks that are coming into those devices. A new thing that's, that's really come up a lot lately, lately is uh, Bluetooth devices and the, the ways of, of attacking Bluetooth as well. What really scares me is these Bluetooth locks. <laughs> I'm not sure if you're, you're, you're familiar with them. I mean, you've got a lock on your house that's opened by Bluetooth and you've got somebody that's able to hack into your Bluetooth and unlock your house. Wow, <laughs> that's really a different vector of attack, right? And uh, enterprise systems. So the, the end goal for, for attackers, as I'm sure we're all very aware of, is to, to actually get you into the, the data that's actually in those enterprise systems. So you're wanting to, 
make uh, multiple layers like an onion to be able to protect those systems depending on what type of data is, is actually on those devices. So um, there are very different avenues of attack nowadays as opposed to when we were looking at say 2000. Um, much more lockdown networks. The perimeter has really changed a lot as well. I recently um, read an article by a, a gentleman in the IEEE security magazine that was talking about how networks have evolved over time. That like back in the 90s, it used to be this ironclad perimeter that you put around with firewalls in front of it. And then slowly it opened up to web, to VPNs, to, to various different things coming into the network. And it's pretty much become Swiss cheese these days. Uh, you can, there's so many different vectors of attack that you can get into to get into the network and mobile devices is really just a continuation of that from, from my point of view. So it, it begs to having a new different way of looking at security, much more one that, that's viewed around looking at the data and being able to classify what type of data is, is more sensitive compared to another type of data. Um, this is just some examples that, that I found from some recent headlines when I was researching my talk of uh, different types of mobile attacks that are actually going on now. Um, as you can see down there, there's uh, Android Wi-Fi attacks that, that are very prevalent out there. But um, just in looking at this, um, this iPhone distribution there, there's quite a lot of iOS in there. And um, by the way, this is a, a, a brand new company that's just starting up and doing mobile malware. And they did a scan with this on a, a telco provider's network of uh, a, a bunch of data that had been going across it. They had something like uh, 650,000 individual devices that they detected going across there. It was all mobile devices because it was a cellular network. And these were the percentages of spy phone um, malware that they could pick out of that data stream that was coming across. It's, it's not as comprehensive as their product actually is in detecting it, but it uh, gives you so, just some idea that it's not just Android that's, that's having, being attacked these days. There's also malware out there and readily available for iOS devices. iOS is almost as much as Android, in that, which yep. is quite surprising. Yeah, yeah, and one of the things that they showed to, to us as well was that um, there are actually forums out there where you can go and buy ready-made kits with command and control centers to be able to, to actually download malware onto all of these different devices. And it doesn't matter what platform it is. They see uh, mobile devices as being an easy way of getting entry into um, to different networks. What they mean by spy phone is they're, they're actually talking about a particular type of attack here, which is much more targeted as well. That's actually where they're trying to put malware on particular people's devices in the enterprise. I mean, people like CEOs or decision makers within enterprises so they can gather data on them. And they're not just looking at the data that's actually on the device. They're also looking at doing things like turning the phone on, the microphone on, so they can record conversations, turning the camera on, turning the locationing sensors on. So they're actually gathering a lot more data uh, through the malware of what they're doing. Uh, these guys, they, they actually demonstrated to us, um, first of all, sending a, an email to somebody. They clicked on a phishing email where they downloaded the malware onto their device. And then they sent a text message to them which the user didn't even open and look at. And it turned on recording of the conversation that we were having in the room. So um, the, the, the threat is actually changing a lot, is, I guess is what I'm, I'm trying to get at here. And it really pays to, to stay up to date with not only the threat directly to WLAN, but also the other more general threats that these mobile devices can be using. Because quite often, those same types of threats that are out there, like with this uh, spy phone example, are also being used to try and attack WLAN ne networks. Um, now, I'm sure we've heard, all heard a lot about the uh, advanced persistent threat attacks, especially um, with some of the, the, the recent news about um, the Chinese attacking us and various other things like that. But um, it's, what's important to realize here is that these, these types of attacks are very, very different uh, in 
in one way, that they're, they're taking a lot more time and a lot more energy and a lot more targeted to get into the network, but also in another way, they're, they're using very similar attack vectors to what have been there in the past. And most of what they're trying to do is to, to say, okay, we know, we realize that, that most people are concerned with network security, are putting security devices on their network to try and capture what we're actually doing. And so we're going to concentrate on, on the, the easiest way of getting an entry point, which is often mobile devices, right? Because they know that they have less security on them than, say, a corporate laptop. And really, um, I think one of the key things that, that you want to look at nowadays is that the behavior of what people are actually doing on the network and being able to figure out what that behavior actually, how that behavior is different from, from what's gone before. So like if Joe who works in the help desk is suddenly accessing the finance server and trying to download um, data from that on the financials of the company, that's really something that you know is unusual and you want to have some sort of flagging as to, to whether that's actually going on. That could indicate the presence of malware on Joe's system. So what can we define as best practice per se? I mean, to me, best practice is always going to be something that's going to be evolving. You're going to have a, a base set of, of configurations and, and, and um, encryption on the network that you've got set up to, to try and protect your network. You're looking at it from a, a, a much more higher holistic viewpoint for the whole network. And um, figuring out that that high level framework is going to give you a set of countermeasures that you can put in place in order to meet the threats that are um, going to be attacking your network. And I'm going to spend some time here today in going over a framework that I uh, have been using within Acuvant to actually uh, deal with uh, um, looking at it from, from a much higher point of view. But really, uh, where we come to from in an everyday sort of thing is, is there's two different parts. There's, educating clients and looking at uh, it from a higher level viewpoint, being able to give them a, a more holistic view of what's needed in the enterprise and then addressing specific deficiencies that they have uh, in, in their wireless security posture to be able to say, yes, we've, we are actually filling out some of the holes where somebody could potentially get a, a way of attacking the network. And know that um, because of the nature of these threats, because it's really hard to plug every threat out there, that there's always going to be more ways that they have to attack the network than you have to defend it. Um, it just the, the mobile devices and how mobile devices have actually changed the whole posture of the network. Um, things like cloud. I mean, how can you be sure that if uh, the mobile devices are accessed in cloud-based networks, that those are actually um, going to be securely protecting the data that's being kept on those. So it, it's always a, a kind of a game of, of trying to, to look at things in totality and trying to, to figure out different methods of protecting it. Myself personally, if I, th I think about where uh, the mobile device industry is right now, the, we've got MDM. That's been a, a very common uh, thing that, that people have been putting in places. But um, we really want to, to look at much more than just one particular solution to, to deal with different threats to the network. Oh, and uh, a last point I'd make, and, and this is because, um, particularly in, in Acuvant, we, we have a, a set of guys who are very good at ha to finding different new ways to, to get into the network. Really, the only way same with doing a, a site survey that you can know that you've got a secure perimeter in place, that you've got some really good level of security is to be constantly doing testing of that and finding people that, that know enough about how the threats are changing that they can develop new attacks to test your defenses. Um, and I, I say to that to, to people all the time wanting to do site surveys too, how can you know that the wireless is working properly if you're not doing a site survey? That's the same in security. Uh, so just to, to talk a little bit more uh, in a, in a real-world sense about uh, how an attacker actually gets into the network, I, I wanted to make sure that I gave you something that was really up-to-date with the way Acumen has actually been um, doing this on, the, on the, our penetration testing side of the house. So I called and spoke to one of our senior assessors before I came here and said, hey, 
what's the methodology that you use? I want to be able to, to talk to um, you all and tell you what the, the, the methodology that our guys are actually using to do testing these days. And he said, well, the, the main part of what we actually do in Acuvant is we, we sit there and gather data on what's going on in the network, look at packet captures, fire up Kismet, um, use things like pineapples, uh, have those set up so that they are actually recording what's going on in the network. And they, they spend quite a bit of time doing analysis of all the data that they're gathering, seeing if there's any chinks in the armor, basically. Um, one thing he said in particular, they look for for handshakes, PSKs, so that they can actually run um, scripts on that. And they, they fire up the GPU-based uh, algorithms to actually test all of those PSKs. Um, it's been for, for quite a long time, but um, really uh, what we generally recommend in talking to people about P using PSKs is you want to have something that's like at least 20 characters long and semi-random num uh, numerals as well, which it makes it hard for the users to input, but really that's the only way of defeating the, the GPU-based cracking that they've got out there for those passwords. And um, he said to me that, that what they're finding more and more these days, especially with enterprise networks, is they'll try and sit out there in the car park far enough away from the building that they can still get wireless signals but not be detected by the WIP system. Um, then they will, uh, they'll sit there and they'll gather and analyze the data after a while. And the most common way that they're, tr they're getting into the networks these days is by leveraging things like uh, mobile phones and mobile devices. When they see them get out there, they'll set up an evil twin get the, um, the mobile device to connect to it, present a, a, a certificate which that device will automatically accept, and then they're connecting and they're um, capturing the username and password that that user is actually sending to get on the network. And the, these um, APs that they set up on their laptops, they'll set them up to say yes to any SSID that's connected to them so that when the, um, the user's phone is scanning through the different networks, It'll, it'll think it's connecting to the, um, to the actual corporate network and automatically start sending it the, the data to, for the assessor to gather. Um, and one of the things they often point out as well to, to their customers is to, to try and limit as far as possible how far the signal goes. Uh, I recently saw a report that they'd done for a, a credit union that we were working with and the credit union is just beside a freeway and the signal was going all the way across to the other side of the freeway. They could basically sit in the car park on the other side of the freeway and, and see the signal from, from that credit union. So you really want to try, I, I know it's in terms of setting up wireless networks, you're trying to make sure that you've got really good coverage anyway, but you need to balance that also with the fact that somebody can be sitting a long way away from the actual building and be attacking the building um, just through using that connection. Yep. Felt like the next level of that was these days is now pretty gooey for the cloud-based cracking appreciate piece. Have you got any experience I, with? I haven't actually used it myself, but um, my understanding is that, that basically it just takes it up up a level in terms of GPU power or CPU power that they can use to do that. Yep. Yeah, and the, and they're not all that expensive to use either. You know, you're wanting to to stick a PSK up there and try and get it cracked. It's it's uh, fairly cheap to do that. I, I would expect that the, those, those type of companies are actually saving the, the hash from it as well so that the next time they see that um, password go up there, they can more easily crack it too. So, mm. so we mentioned targets. So in the case of target, uh, where you've got vendors that are actually being attacked, mm -hmm. Well, so I think part of what PCI does, all right, is uh, it looks at um, also who's connecting to your network and how they're connecting as well. Uh, we actually, as uh, a company that deals with security all the time for other uh, third parties, are often asked to have audits done of how our networks are, are doing and connecting to them too. And that's really all, all that you can do is require that other company to have certain standards in terms of we want to audit your network, we want to know what's going on with your network and be able to, to look and um, have some sort of report that you can go back to. And if, 
if you're being hacked in through somebody else's network, then they're usually going to be end up with some liability in that case too. So would it be fair to extend that auto process to vendors as well? Yeah, they and I think that actually so. that actually happens as part of the the PCI standards. Is you're required to ask for audits to be done with third party vendors that are uh, communicating with your network as well. I, the, the interesting thing to me about the target attack is that they're getting it through uh, POS terminals. That's, uh, and there's a lot of Windows XP out there in POS terminals. You can just see that becoming more and more of a problem for retailers. Um, so going back to, to what I was saying before, I like to look at security as, as a framework, right? If you, you get a kind of a high level framework that you're able to look at the problem from, it gives you much more of a, a way of looking to see if there are any actual holes in there. Um, this, this slide, the picture on this slide is actually something I downloaded uh, off Google, <laughs> of course. So it goes into a little bit more, but the, the framework that I've kind of developed in order to, to look at both WLAN and mobile device security is, uh, is basically looking first at the policies and processes that you have surrounding that, um, looking at the controls that you've got. To me, authentication is a core part of a security strategy, so you really want to have um, your authentication systems uh, so that they're using a really good um, level of, of being able to identify positively who the user and who the device actually is, and monitoring. People often, uh, the companies that we work with forget about the monitoring part, and it's not just network monitoring. All of that information that you can get in there also gives you a, a, a good view into general security that's going on with the network as well. So digging into that a little bit deeper. Oh, it's a lot louder. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, digging into that a little bit deeper, uh, the security policies that you, that you have are really the foundation of your security program for the double land. And that's an extension of what the corporate security policies are that you have within your organization too. So you're really wanting to, to actually make sure that they're all in concert with each other, that they're not just individual policies written for specific use cases. Um, the, uh, the security policies, even when you're doing something uh, related to um, WLAN like PKI, but not directly uh, a part of the, the, the PKI network, is, is also something that you want to tie back into the corporate security policies. And um, going back to, to what I was mentioning before about the perimeter being Swiss cheese now, I think the only way to really deal with that in a comprehensive way is by dis data classification and classifying the different types of business data you've got. So of course you'll put much more security around the financial data of your corporation than you would around the website. The website's public information, you may want to make sure the security is enough to prevent it from being defaced, but um, you really, you, the information that's actually on it, you want it to be kind of public so anyway. And so being able to classify even within a WLAN, the different types of data that's going across it, what uh, different users types you have on that is, is a way of being able to, to figure out what levels of security you need for, for different things in there. And I relate that back, the, the business data of classification, to also um, classifying what the different use cases are for the WLAN. Um, guest is a completely different use case to internal corporate users. and uh, you're really wanting to have a completely different security posture for those two, two individuals. Um, Question. Yeah. So, so specific to security, how important are products like IEC and Clearhouse? I'm getting, I'll get to that. <laughs> um, so in, in terms of uh, the, the actual policies, you really, uh, half of the battle is, is actually educating your users. Um, I think one of the most common ways our assessors have of actually getting into networks is they use social engineering attacks. And the only way you can really bridge that, uh, that bridge, get across that bridge is, is by giving them uh, acceptable use policies for, for the activities that they're actually doing and giving them education in uh, what things they should be giving out and what things they should be asking questions of. I remember several years ago I was doing a wireless site survey up in Boulder and um, 
I, I had to go around the whole building, do a survey of the whole building, and I'm wandering around with this laptop. And the only person that ever asked me what I was doing there happened to be the CEO's secretary. And I'm like, that's awesome. This, somebody is actually paying enough attention to what's going on that they're like, why are you walking around with a laptop? <laughs> And uh, I think what it comes down to in the end as well is that uh, in very much practical terms, you can get a high degree of security by, and, and make things really, really secure in your network, but often you'll prevent the business from actually doing what it's there for. So you really need to balance what the business's needs are with the uh, security risks that there are out there and know enough about that to explain to them why you would want to, to have this type of security policy in place and uh, what that means to your, your business. Uh, I'm sure Target, for example, is very aware of uh, some of the risks that, that they have been taken. Uh, so there's a very good framework out there um, called the SANS 20, which goes into um, security uh, controls in very, a lot of different areas, and they have 20 different controls. Wireless is one of the ca controls that they have in there. And I pulled this, this slide, uh, the picture on the slide, out of one of those, um, the parts of that security control. And that's, that's a good framework for giving you a more of a high level view of what different controls that you can put in place to meet um, the, the counteract the, the different threats to the network. So. Uh, I, would, I would highly encourage you to go and look on SANS and, and look for that. They have a, an excellent poster that you can download with all of the 20 controls though, and different vendors' products on there that you can use to meet those different controls. Uh, I'm sorry? Yeah, it's the SANS 20, it's called. Uh, and I think security controls are really something that we deal with more on a daily basis. We're more... Uh, in, in terms of setting up wireless network, looking directly at what those actual controls are that we can put in place to meet the, the different threats that are coming in the network. Of course, we deal with the access points um, and uh, setting up the wireless IDS, possibly if, uh, if the customer actually wants to do that. But there's also other things such as um, putting things on the clients to be able to, to maintain the security of the clients. Um, being able to have active scanning going on the network. Um, a, a new one that's, that's been uh, very popular in recent years are, are things like uh, network malware scanners like FireEye and Dambala, those types of products. And they're, they're able to actually look at the data that's going across the network and detect malware from that. That's the active scanner part. Um, you've also got a certain amount of device management that you need to have in there uh, for the wireless devices and configuration for those wireless devices and it's not just the access points but also being able to push out configuration to the clients i think one of the things in in the past few years has been really nice to see is that because of the whole uh, mdm thing coming along there's been much more acceptance of of trying to get mac laptops and get some sort of security configuration onto those than there has been in the past. They always used to be sort of something on the outside that we didn't really want to deal with. We just wanted everybody on our Windows domain. Um, and that's been, been much more now that they're looking at putting controls in place and including that in the, the overall security posture of the network. Uh, as I mentioned before, I think authentication is, is actually one of the core parts uh, that, that you need to um, secure the network. And one of the, the main reasons for that is that you can individually identify the users and devices uh, that are on your network um, by using secure or strong authentication. Um, I'm, I suppose it could be a little bit controversial saying that PEEP is no longer enough, but, but just having seen the, um, the, the easy ways that you can use to attack it and the, the number of devices that are popping up and just blindly accepting certificates on the network and letting the users do that. I think it's no longer enough to, to say that you're secure if you're just using PEEP or TTLS on your network because um, your users are just going to blindly accept whatever certificates are being sent to those mobile devices and it may end up compromising your network just as an attack vector through that. So uh, 
in a lot of the conversations that I've had with different companies where they've been talking about how to deal with the mobile devices on their network, I, I suppose about a year, year and a half ago, the conversation was mostly like, well, I don't know where the devices are. How can I figure out whether, who's using mobile devices on my network? Because people would bring in their mobile device from home, just use their username and password and immediately be on the wireless network. Um, and then, uh, so we, we started suggesting a, uh, a methodology of using Radius and PKI set up to being able to, and having a combination of a, um, something like ClearPass or IEC on the network and a, an MDM server to be able to push um, certificates down to mobile devices uh, and being able to tie that back into an Active Directory infrastructure to positively identify those users and also get some separation in between their laptop versus their mobile device being on the network and uh, enforce different security postures based on that as well. I think that's really what that's mainly all about. Yeah. Uh, so the question was if we, I ever had a customer ask for a higher level security than, than just certificates like one-time passwords and, uh, and actually make it work. And yes, we did have that. Uh, we had a customer who, who wanted to not only put a certificate infrastructure in, but also have a one-time password. When the user went and requested the, the certificate, they would be sent to their mobile device, a one-time password they had to put in to actually get the certificate issued to their device. And we set up an entire framework with that, uh, along with SSL VPN connection, where they would authenticate to. Um, also had uh, another customer who we set up certificate-based uh, authentication for their SSL VPN. And um, they wanted a, a two-step authentication, not only having the certificate be authentication, but once they had been authenticated with their certificate, also have to put in their Active Directory password. And we set that up so that it pulled their username out of the certificate because they used their email address as their username. And they, they wouldn't have an opportunity to actually put the username in. They had to put a password that matched the username that was on the certificate. So um, I have a, a, a very uh, talented colleague who works in uh, SIM. He's, uh, most of his uh, work has been done recently in, in working with ArcSight, which is a very, very expensive sim. But uh, he does a lot more than that as well. And uh, through him, I was very much impressed on why you need to actually have more than just collecting logs to be able to, to have some security monitoring in your network. Um, so the, the essential difference between SIM and, and just general logging is, is really what it's doing is it's correlating different events that come in the network. So say somebody is, has attached to the wireless network and then they've, they've gone and accessed a, a server that they don't usually access, that would bring up an alarm and actually alert somebody and that. And half of the, the work of actually setting that, um, uh, that type of system up in the network is not only integrating it in with the um, the security appliances that are being used in the network, Active Directory, any types of logging on routers and switches and those types of things that are going on, but also in writing things that correlate those different events together and being able to get useful information out of it. Because nobody wants to see events popping up all day long for something that's really not important to them. They really want to see uh, data that's actually going to give them some indication of something's importance going on. So uh, I really say, think that, that especially in WLAN security, it needs to go beyond just uh, having a logging of events that are, that are going on in the network. It needs to integrate in with a wider set of security um, things that are being done on the network and having some sort of uh, system like a, a SIM or a DLP. And to me, DLP is just another way of monitoring, but it's monitoring the data rather than monitoring the events that are going on and uh, having some incident response program set up to be able to deal with that as well. So uh, that type of monitoring gives you visibility in what's going on in the network. It's the same as looking at um, the RF signal that, that various clients are using around the network. You need to be able to, to see what's going on to be able to tell when there is some sort of problem on the network. 
I'm probably going a little bit too fast with this, but if I finish early, I'll be able to take more questions. <laughs> All right. Um, so this particular slide here came from uh, one of my colleagues who works uh, primarily in the risk management side of Acuvant, and uh, it was looking from a much higher point of, view, point of view as to what you would do in general to do with the security program and, and how that would affect directly WLAN and mobile security. And really it's a cycle. You're wanting to, to constantly be looking at a process of going on, of constantly reevaluating what's going on in your network, uh, assessing the risks to the network and how those are changing uh, when the, the business changes and starts to do things in different ways, like the whole, whole move to mobile lately has really changed totally the security posture of the network. So you're wanting to be able to reassess risks and develop policies to address those risks and look at what controls can help uh, meet the needs of, uh, of being able to uh, address the risks that, that you have to your business. Uh, and of course it's really essential to be able to, to, to constantly have a, a testing program for that. Uh, I noticed that the, the PCI 3 standards that were just brought out have been much more focused on instead of saying you must have this in your network to looking more at what the actual process is for everything. It's become uh, much more of a, they've, they've realized that it's not enough to just say you need to have a WIPS, you need to have uh, WPA enabled in your network, but also that you've got to look at it in terms of what's the process that you have around that. Are you actually taking all the steps that you need for that? And I would say even going further than that, if you're under some sort of standard like PCI, you're wanting to look at it just from the point of view of your whole business reputation of going further than that, making sure that you're, you're developing a, a security program for it that looks at the, the whole scope of what you're actually trying to protect in your network. All right, so. Uh, as I'm emphasizing a little bit here is really you don't want to, to, to get into a static posture of, of saying, oh, if I just go out and implement this radius server and do 802.1x, I'm, I'm fine, I'm good to go. Uh, you really want to look at it as more of a, a, a process that you're actually going through and constantly reevaluating what, uh, what other things are both can, can help improve the security posture of the network, but also can help enable the business to, to be able to, to do more with the, the network that they do have. And I, I talked to several larger customers that we have about the need to implement a strong authentication system uh, for their network as well. And uh, I think with, with mobile networks now, that it's really key to, to have that all integrated together, come back to, to some sort of integrated database that you're using, such as Active Directory, which is very common these days. Um, and, and have that tied into a strong authentication system such as PKO or two-factor authentication. Um, by the way, has, has anyone got a different use case for when you would use a um, two-factor authentication system versus a PKI when, when you might want to actually use those? <coughs> probably, probably a bit too far up there. Um, so I had a, a, an interesting presentation from uh, Semantic. I was seeing through a webinar that they had a little while ago on there. They have both a two-factor authentication system as well as a PKI. And um, they said that the main reasoning for going for a two-factor authentication system is ease of rollout. If you've got a lot of users and you just want to get a higher level of security relatively quickly out to those users, then it, it really makes sense to go with a two-factor authentication system because you can quickly get that rolled out to them and get and improve the security posture just through doing that. PKI takes much more time and care to actually get it up and running. Um, the advantage of that is if you've got a lot more users to deal with, you've actually got a strong authentication system. Uh, after a while, two-factor authentication system becomes a really big load for the, um, the help desk and the various people that are maintaining it to actually keep up with all of the keys that go stale, somebody's lost their password and needs a reset and things like that. Whereas PKI takes all of that issue away from you because it's just a certificate on the device. It's largely you can get an automated system for generating those certificates and renewing those certificates for users. Yes, Jay? Mm-hmm. 
factor across most life? Uh, so it, it's really just a way of, of authenticating on the network, right? So uh, if you're using, say, an RSA key, you've got another password and that can be combined into a single password which is part of it is a username and part of it is a number that you're putting in or you can uh, that's that's one way that you could do it is instead of the user actually having to put in the active directory password uh, they're actually putting in the the uh, one-time password from their key file the also you could um, just thinking off the top of my head here, you could have the, the client set up so that they're actually supporting two factors of authentication. So um, say a captive portal, for example, you could have them log into a captive portal and authenticate that way uh, via SSL. Um, mostly what we see uh, two-factor authentication being used for in wireless is, um, not in wireless, I'm sorry, is in VPNs where they've got a VPN page that they're logging into and they've got two fields to any of the authentication system in there. But um, I have currently an account with Semantics Managed PKI set up and uh, on that I have a certificate on my system that's been issued to my system to log into that as well as it pops up for a password that I'm logging into that. So that's effectively two factors to me. That's a Uh, the two factors generally refers to you've got um, something you have, something you know, those types of things. So you've got two different things that, that you're inputting in to be able to do the authentication. So, but how are you inputting? Uh, I, I don't know what to write. No problem. Um, just how, like, I've not seen a Windows implementation where it's like I go connect and it has that third field for a wireless. Ah, uh, okay. I see what you mean. Uh, I mean, I did the tap before where it's like, oh, hey, log in the tap before. Right. Right. Third party app, uh, or... uh, no, generally two-factor systems uh, rely on having some sort of external key fob device, whether it's in your phone or whether it's an actual physical key fob yourself. I think mostly what I've seen in wireless networks is people just don't go down that path because it's far easier to implement something like uh, um, 802.1x to, to actually do that authentication for them. That's not to say that you can't do that, but... Um, I think they, they find it just simpler to implement a PKI and be able to have all of the authentication done with that. Couldn't you just enter your username and password field as a pen? The yes. One time password. So right. it's just a standard username and login and you just look at your key file <coughs> password and then you have those digits and it's just constantly changing. So that's still two factor within a standard self login. Right. And it's just, it uses the one password field with both your password that you know and also the one. The, changing key. Uh, that, in all of the one-time password systems that I've seen like that, they've all had that ability to be able to combine those both those things just in the one password field if the particular authentication system that you're using doesn't support having two different fields. Any other questions about that? All right. Um, Moving on from here, I, I really think that apart from specific use cases, PSK is not enough. Um, basically what I generally say to people when I'm going in, if they, they really have a specific need for a PSK, say they've got a device that only supports PSK that they have to use for their business, what you're wanting to do with those devices is isolate it off. Make sure that that's actually not uh, giving them general access to the network, but it's actually locking it down to the particular use case for that device. So say it's a, a scanning gun, for example. You give the, the, you set up a wireless network specifically for those PSK devices, make sure that the firewall that that's behind is set up in such a way that it can only access the server that it needs to upload the, the scanning data to, and um, basically have it locked down that way because, I mean, they may have a password on all those devices that, that prevents you from being able to access it now, but who's to say that they may not develop some new way in, in the near future that's able to easily guess a 20-character pa random password. Um, what 
WPA Enterprise does, even just from not looking at the security, but is that it enables you to be able to individually identify things. And that's really what the, the biggest downside to the PSKs is that you've got, if you've got individual device authentication and somebody loses their phone, you're not locking the whole user out of their account just because they've lost their phone. You're able to actually say, say okay, I'm going to um, remove access for that phone from the network and being able to to actually individually identify those devices and, and uh, people on the network. I think uh, one of the biggest things that you run into is somebody leaves the com company who's maybe in an important position. I'm sure you go into Active Directory and change your username and password, but um, you also may want to make sure that you're able to not only revoke their access to the network, but also make sure any um, systems that may not update so, so often are, are locking down their, their access. And um, I, I wrote a somewhat controversial blog post a little while ago on, on WIPs, which uh, didn't win me any friends, apparently. <laughs> but but uh, I, I still believe that WIPs is really an essential part of the network. It's just that uh, I see it in, in future is becoming more and more something that, because it's relatively static, um, it relies a lot on signatures to, to be able to detect behavior in the network, that it's going to be more and more integrated into basic functionality of wireless LAN controllers. Um, something that's uh, like uh, I, I'm, I'm personally work more with Aruba than anything else, and um, Aruba has integrated in the Palo Alto's detection in with their um, capabilities that they have, and that they've still got the WIPS module there that's still out there to be able to detect attacks, but they're more and more integrating it in with the controller. And I really think that, that um, it, there are advantages, of course, to a dedicated WIP system. But uh, less and less, that's becoming relevant, I believe. Uh, and, and the other point to make about I, wired IPS systems, and uh, a lot of them are not detecting those zero-day attacks and those um, APT-type attacks because they don't have a signature for that. If you haven't seen it before, how can you detect that it's going to happen? So you, you need to have systems that rely much more on heuristics, on looking at behavior anomalies and being able to figure out, okay, this, this person's doing something that they've never been doing before, and uh, I don't believe that either wired or wireless IPS systems really have a, a strong ability to detect those types of attacks. Um, going back to what you were asking, John, um, I really think that, that the uh, advanced radius solutions like ISC and ClearPass are really pushing the, the uh, up, upping the security of networks and they're really something that should be considered in, uh, in integrating in with your wireless networks. It's not just that they provide things like onboarding for mobile devices, um, like Abby's talk yesterday, you know, I think she, she talked about that a lot and some of the advantages of integrating that in with the, the wireless system, but, but also that gives you a finer grained level of control over access to the network by integrating that in. And to me, whenever I'm talking to, to one of my customers about um, setting up their wireless networks, I, I, I say what you're really wanting to do is to, to make the radius system the central part of your network. It's, it's being able to gather information, it's being able to talk to the MDM server and, and verify that that mobile device is actually registered with that. It's able to actually separate out what that device is supposed to be doing based on um, the security posture of it um, and, and being able to give you much more ability to do that. Um, a, a question that frequently comes up with people, uh, especially with uh, a large number of Macs in their environment, is how can we actually do machine-based authentication for the Macs? Well, as everybody knows, Macs do not do machine-based authentication. Um, so you have uh, the, the ability to put a certificate on it and have it automatically get on the network as it's booting up and then have a login screen, but you've still got uh, only one certificate to authenticate it to the network. Well, the advanced uh, radius solutions give you the ability to be much more flexible in terms of how you're classifying those devices. So you can classify it based on what type of device it is. A uh, MacBook versus a, an iOS device versus an Android device. And put different security pol policies around that on those devices and being able to, to lock down what they're doing. Now that takes a, a whole lot more work to get those set up and get those running and integrated in with the other security devices in your network, but there's a big win there in terms of being able to, to identify much more really what's going on with the network. Chris, what do you think the 
Holy Grail is, I mean, you've got all these different flavors of mm -hmm. security out there, right? And how do you get them to cooperate across all the devices in the network? I mean, there's zero day, DPI. I don't but think there is a Holy Grail, to be honest. Uh, I, I think it's just, uh, uh, it's more like playing whack-a-mole. You're, you're constantly trying to, to look at what new threats are coming in, whack that one, oh, there's another one popped up over there, whack that one, and trying to, to look on it from a high enough level of point of view that you're covering the major holes that you've got in the network and covering yourself as best you can. So how do you take those requirements and turn them into a business justification? Uh, that's where we go back to balancing the, the needs of the business with the risks. So um, by looking at it from, and, and our, our guys in the, um, in the risk management side of the house deal with this quite regularly, is they, they are using frameworks not strictly based on, on the, the legal requirements, but uh, higher level frameworks that look at the, the whole of the business and saying, well, if you've got a really small business over here, then you may not need to have all of these big security appliances in place that are going to cost you a whole bunch of money. But if you've got something that's really, really critical to you, to the core running of your business, you're going to pay more attention to protecting that versus um, just a public website. So um, it really does come, that, come down to having that, that type of conversation with it as considering the different risks to the business and letting the business owner balance those risks against the, the needs for him to actually run his business and what his business can actually afford. Any other questions? All right. Um, as I mentioned before, I think that monitoring is a very critical thing that's often left out. And um, that, that really needs to, to be addressed in a better way. Uh, I think that there are several solutions out there that can actually give you better monitoring visibility. And integrating it in with a SIM or a DLP type system as well just gives you additional capabilities of being able to figure out what's going on. Uh, to me, in the whole mo management field, I've, I've deliberately stayed at arm's length away from MDM for a long time. Uh, we found most of the MDM vendors we, we worked with tended to, to do installations themselves, so there wasn't really a huge need for us to get into that as a business. But for me as a security professional, mostly MDM is about managing devices. It's not about security. You get some security features that are thrown in there, but uh, really I hadn't seen a huge push to that and uh, there was a spectrum for me as well. There's on, on the one end there was managing devices all the way to protecting data so, and, and MAM and EMM is sort of a midpoint in between that where you're providing app-based VPNs and more um, particular fine-grained look at the data that's on mobile devices. Um, and also from that, now I'm starting to see the first wave of new mobile uh, security solutions coming out for mobile malware. Um, two companies I've highlighted here are Lacoon and Zimperium. And uh, they're specifically set up to look at mobile devices. So what they're, they're doing is uh, they're looking at the mobile security posture of those devices and being able to do some sort of detection as to what those devices and applications on those devices are actually doing on the network. Um, they're actually in the cloud, and what the, so they're able to install their app onto the device, and it's their app being installed onto the device that gives them the visibility into what the different applications on that mobile device are doing. I'm sorry? Oh, no, it's iOS based, yeah. Um, Symperium, I believe, is just Android right now. Uh, Lacoon has both iOS and Android uh, support, and uh, also, I think, Mac OS. I'm not 100% certain of that. Um, I, I've worked a lot with NAC, and um, I know that NAC is a, is a part of both ISC and ClearPass, but for, for me, the whole approach to NAC just kind of rubs me up the wrong way. It seems a very complex technology that's, that's sort of looking at every piece of hay in the haystack to try and find a needle, uh, which is, gets really, really difficult and complex to, to do on the network. I, I don't know that there's yet been a product that I've seen out there that really addresses that. But uh, perhaps in being integrated more within the, um, the radius solutions, it's going to give a bit of visibility into the network. Uh, and as we're all probably aware by now, 
the client is really the biggest risk factor that you've got in the network and you need to, to basically pay some attention to securing the clients. Uh, and I know that, that possibly most of the, the people who are bringing their own mobile device into the network is, are wanting to limit as much as possible the visibility into that, but that really is a policy decision for the business to be able to say, okay, if you want to use your mobile device here on our network, then this is what you've got to meet. Um, I, I know uh, I have met the, the guy who's the uh, CIO f of Netflix, and uh, I, I like the way he addresses the whole issue and that he's saying, um, to me it's not BYOD, it's UAD, use any device. You can use any device that you want on my network as long as you've got a certificate on it and I know it's secure. And that provides you with a, a, a much wider set of tools that you can use to enable people to get their, bus uh, their job done. Um, one thing to emphasize too is that containerization approaches can be beaten. Um, the, the Lacoon people actually demonstrated that for me and they had a good enterprise installed on the Android device which is supposedly separates off all the data. They installed a piece of malware on that Android device and they were capturing emails and messages that were being sent to good through that. So it, it can be gotten around and it's not the be all and end all of security on mobile devices. Is that true even though with containerization there's perhaps VPN capabilities with, with the same scenario? Plot? Yeah, so uh, basically what you're fighting against is once you've got access to the device then you can do things like jailbreaking or rooting and insert things into it that can get past the binaries on, those co on the containerization codes and intercept messages that are going back and forth from it. And that's, that's really going to be a limitation of that approach is that uh, you're going to always have that entry point if you've got access to the device. All right. That was my final slide. Any, any final, final questions? <laughs> Thank you.